Hello, everyone. Welcome to Enhance Your App Security and Availability with Elastic Load Balancing. I am John Zobris. I lead customer success for ELB. With me is Satya Ramaseshan, who leads product. Today, we're going to cover two topics, availability and security. We're going to follow the format where we're going to talk about how we do it, what we think internally, and then what we've built into the products, how you can leverage them for similar things. Throughout the presentation, we're going to use these icons to kind of represent a section where you've got internal details we're sharing, how we think about things. We'll have a new feature launch uh, for things we've launched within about the last year, uh, and some things we launched this year at reInvent. We'll have design consideration, things you can do that you can apply and use in your own architectures. Uh, and then we'll have some links to the documentation as QR codes, which we will try to pause on so you can scan them if you want. After this session, you should have a good idea of how we think about availability and security as a service and how we've built that into the products that you can use and what you can do today with the new features that we've launched over the last year. So let's jump right in. Um, for uh, just to call out, the QR code here at the bottom is actually a best practices site that we've launched. Right now, we've got our security best practices up, so you can take a look at that. It's specific to elastic load balancing, uh, but we will have the availability one up shortly. So we're going to cover three areas for availability. We're going to talk about scaling, we're going to talk about health, and then operations. So elastic load balancers scale to support virtually any size workload. We'll talk about how we do that, how our systems work, and one of the things we do is provision redundancy, and we'll talk about how you can do the same thing. So application load balancer scales first up and then out. When you create a load balancer and start sending traffic to it, it will detect the increase in traffic and replace the current size nodes with larger ones. Once we get to the largest node size that we're using, we'll start scaling out, so adding more, more and more nodes in each availability zone. The key thing to remember or to know is that we scale up aggressively, we'll trigger scaling in seconds, deliver capacity in minutes, and continue scaling up aggressively if the traffic continues to increase. On the flip side, we scale down very cautiously. So we gate our scaling down, to make sure that we're not scaling down in periods where you may have a sinusoidal day-night pattern. If you scale up during the day and then scale back down in the night, your traffic, we actually won't scale the load balancer down. So we try to do that because it's a very common behavior for traffic. Um, the less things we change will make it so your workload is smoother. Another critical thing we do is we scale on multiple dimensions. We scale on almost every dimension of your traffic. So we'll talk about how you can leverage that with auto-scaling. So NLB and Gateway Load Balancer use a slightly different scaling system, and that is because they leverage AWS Hyperplane. Hyperplane is a system that lets us use an elastic network interface married with the software-defined network of EC2 to distribute traffic transparently using one IP address to many different hosts. The main benefits of Hyperplane are you get a static IP address, so that ENI doesn't change for the life of the load balancer, and the IP doesn't change. You also get persistent flows through it, which means you can have a flow going through it, and if there's a failure or something happens, the flow won't be impacted. The transparent scaling you get from that is for the same reason. The flow can keep going, and we can actually swap out all of the hosts supporting it without impacting the flow. And we're actually doing this all the time on your network and gateway load balancers. It's just a regular occurrence. As traffic scales up, we scale up. As it scales down, we scale down. Now, for network load balancer, the critical difference from the application load balancer is that we actually scale independently per availability zone. So Hyperplane is a very zonal construct. It's not aware of any other zones. Within a zone, everything in Hyperplane stays within that zone. Because of that, your network and gateway load balancers will scale up transparently in different zones based on the traffic detected in that zone. They still scale up aggressively and down cautiously, just like ALB. And it is transparent. So whenever we're changing those hosts out, the flows that are established don't notice it. New flows continue to be established uh, without any risk. So I mentioned over-provisioning. And what we think about when we're deciding how much to over-provision is we look at your load and say, we really want to have at least one availability zone worth of extra capacity at any time. And the reason for that is twofold. 
First, we use it if there's a surge in traffic. We already have a little bit of extra capacity that we can use when we trigger the scaling. And again, we trigger scaling in seconds, deliver the capacity in minutes. The other reason is that if there is a failure, perhaps your targets, perhaps something else happens, and we need to get out of the zone, we can be assured that we have capacity in the other zones waiting there to accept that traffic. So if we have a, an issue or you fail away from a zone, the other zones will already be scaled up for the ELB. So how can you do this with your own workload? So the same kinds of concepts where you can pre and over provision. And the way we do that is not actually by looking and saying we need this many hosts, but it's by lowering our thresholds. So in this example, we're gonna do a CPU threshold and we're gonna go all the way down to 35%. So if our CPU goes over 35%, we're gonna trigger scaling up. We also do multiple dimensions. So we have, for application load balancer, a request per target that you can create a scaling policy and try to target the exact number of requests you want. And when it goes above that, auto scaling will provision more hosts. So in this case, we've got a CPU threshold of 35% and a target of 50 requests per target. And what that means is we probably need about a third more than that, so maybe 75 requests is our actual where we think our, our fleet would be healthy, but because we're using three AZs, we wanna over provision by one AZ, we've reduced that number, so we'll scale sooner. Obviously, that's not simple math that works in every case, so definitely load testing and seeing what you can do with the number of hosts you have is still a crucial part of determining how much to over provision. And then when you're scaling down, the two ways you can scale down cautiously are one, you can have a cool down, so you say 12 hours, we're not gonna cool down. We will, once we've scaled up, we, we know that we won't have a scaling for 12 hours. The other thing you can do is have a lower threshold to scale down. So we're not targeting 35%, we're triggering when we go over 35%, and then we're gonna scale down if we go all the way down below 15%. So let's talk about some of the availability things that we have just built into the platform, things we do, things you can do. We'll talk through health checks. We'll talk through two features we launched last year. Uh, the target group fail open and DNS fail over thresholds. We'll talk about cross zone off for ALB, and we'll talk about anomaly detection and some things we launched this year. So just like you have health checks to your targets, we health check all of the load balancer nodes. So every IP that you have in your load balancer is getting health checks from our internal systems constantly. We make frequent health checks. When we detect a failure, we replace the node with a new healthy node. We're storing the traffic. So when you're looking at configuring your target group health checks, there's two areas where you configure. The timing, so how frequently you're going to have health checks, the interval for how many health checks you're going to need to, to pass healthy and unhealthy, and then the thresholds for unhealthy and healthy. So this is the same for network load balancer as it is for application load balancer. You can configure the exact number of seconds, and then you can configure independently the unhealthy count versus the healthy count. So when you're thinking about what should you include in the health checks, what dependency should be there, the question I always ask is, if this dependency failed, would you want the request to still go, the response to still go to the client? And if the answer is yes, then you can probably leave that out of your health check. But if it's no, you may want to include that in the health check so that you won't be sending requests from a target that couldn't completely respond to what your clients need. And finally, HTTP health checks are generally better than TCP health check. Your TCP health check is only doing a simple handshake, and your operating system could be up, your listener could be up, and you may not actually have your application able to respond. This would pass a TCP health check, whereas an HTTP health check, you're gonna get a deeper level of knowing your application is actually up and running. So let's talk about the first feature that we launched last year. Uh, this is the target group fail open threshold. Your target groups already have this threshold since day one, but it's 100%. So what is fail open? Fail open is treating all targets in a target group as if they're healthy, whether they're healthy or not. And today, if you haven't changed the threshold, all of the targets need to fail their health checks to trigger fail open. So the thing this is useful for is if there is an overload scenario. If you have a big surge in traffic and it overloads your targets and they start failing. The problem with this is, as your targets fail, the ALB stops routing requests to them, and you get more and more concentration on fewer and fewer targets until you get to a point where all of your targets are unhealthy, and then you fail open. So that's what the default behavior of 
We definitely recommend looking at this and considering changing it to something more appropriate for your workload. In this example, we have a 50% routing fail open threshold. And we have 10 targets, 90% of them are healthy. So what is the ALB going to do? And the NLB, they're going to route only to the healthy targets. Now if things start to get worse and more targets start failing, but we don't cross that threshold, we'll keep narrowing the targets that we're sending traffic to, and only those ones. Eventually, if you cross the threshold, so here we've gone to six targets unhealthy and we're only 40% healthy, we're gonna fail open and start sending the traffic to all of the targets as if they were healthy. This can let you recover from an overload without having a bad customer experience if those targets were actually able to respond to some of the requests. Again, this is useful for the overload scenario. Um, so consider changing the default from 100%. So when you're looking at your target group and it's failing open, the next thing in front of that to help route around impairments is the DNS. So ELBs have Route 53 health checks. Every ELB, internal and external, has a Route 53 health check that you get for free with the service. And what that health check does is removes any IPs from DNS if they become unhealthy or fail their health check. If you have a target group where you've configured this threshold to be lower for your target group fail open, it may not trigger DNS fail away for just the only the zone that it's in if there's a zonal impact. And what that means is if you have, say, target group in one zone that leads you over the threshold for your DNS fail open, all of the zones will start failing open. And when all of the zones fail open, they're failing their Route 53 health check, and you really need another endpoint or place to direct that traffic. So if you've got an ALB and you've got another ALB, maybe another region, something that you've already configured in Route 53 to fail over to, then having cross zone on with this lower threshold can help. However, if you don't have anywhere to fail over to, you may wanna consider using cross zone off. The primary benefit of this is if you have a problem in one zone, the other zones can continue to receive traffic and only that zone can wait out. So this is useful to fail away from an availability zone, and the default for this threshold, it's a separate threshold from the fail open, is 100%. We also recommend looking at changing this to something lower just to get out of a zone. And again, this works best with cross zone off unless you have another place to fail over to, like another load balancer in another region or another service. So let's talk really quickly about application load balancer cross zone off. So this was a feature that we launched last year, and it's just what it says, you can turn off cross zone load balancing. What that means is when the traffic comes into a zone, it won't leave that zone from the load balancer. So the load balancer nodes in that zone will only send traffic to the same zone. The advantage of this is you get zonal isolation and you have an easy way to fail away from the front door if there's a zonal failure. The key thing to keep in mind when you're looking at this is do I have enough capacity and are all of my resources that my targets need, all of my dependencies available in every zone. Ideally they are, and you can have the same number of targets in all zones and scale the same way, and then you can use cross zone off. If you don't have that, with cross zone off, you may get an imbalance of traffic where some targets are getting more traffic than they can handle because there's fewer of them. So this integrates really well with Route 53 application recovery controllers feature for zonal shift. Zonal shift lets you tell Route 53 remove this zone from this load balancer's DNS. Now we're doing this all the time because those Route 53 health checks, if they start failing, are gonna fail away from the same IPs. But with zonal shift, you can configure this, you could do it for testing, you could do it because you had other alarms or something that was triggering you to get out of the zone, but it lets you have an easy way using Route 53's highly available control plane to send a signal and say, get us out of this zone completely for this load balancer. So while we're talking about zones, we wanna talk about a feature that we just launched this year. It's network load balancer zonal affinity. And it's just like it sounds. Your zone that the client is in will be the zone that the Route 53 DNS record returns for that request. So when your clients are in EC2 and they're zonal, they can connect to your NLB and either get 100% zonal affinity or you can pick 85%. Now the default is 100% uh, 
all of the DNS records are 0% zonal affinity. And if you have a use case where you want to save on or, or have lower latency and save on costs for cross-zone traffic, this can help keep things in the zone. It still works with all of our DNS health checks, all of the Route 53 zonal shift. You can still fail away from that, and it will shift traffic to the other zones. The 85% of the time <coughs> configuration is the most useful because it keeps 15% across zone, so you won't be surprised if it does fail over because something happens and you fail away from that zone. You'll already have 15% of your traffic going across the zone. 100% uh, is a good setting too, if you really wanna keep things isolated to that zone, uh, but definitely check that out. So the next thing we wanna talk about is anomalies. So held checks are great for detecting hard failures, we know something broke, we know our dependencies aren't working, we're going to fail our health check or we're unreachable, something crashed. But a lot of failures are gray failures, where there's something underperforming or not doing as well as it should be. And internally at ELB, we've got a system that looks at all of the nodes in a load balancer and compares them against each other. And if one of them is an outlier, it, go, it proactively replaces that one with a new healthy node. Now when we're doing these replacements, and we do the same when we do scaling, we use a graceful replacement strategy, which means we launch the new node, we put it in DNS, we pull the old node out of DNS, and we let it drain. And we will let those drain until they have zero connections for five minutes. So we'll let them drain for a potentially long time. Now this system has saved us from so many gray failures and helped all of our customers have a higher availability posture. We thought it would be awesome if we could do this for their targets. So this year we launched automatic target weights for ALB, and what this does is monitor the target responses and targets who send errors back or who are unable to be connected to. It shifts the traffic away from them. So let's say your backend starts returning 500 errors and the other backends are not. We will shift rapidly the traffic away from that. And we use a multiplicative increase or decrease, so we, sh we we scale that way down. Now this is not a health check. It is not going to cause the health check to fail. And we don't ever go to zero because we still need to send some requests to that target to make sure that when it recovers, we can detect it and scale back, send it more traffic. So if this target starts recovering, we do a slow additive increase. So we're not gonna ramp it straight back up to 100% of the distribution, but we'll slowly add more and more as long as it's continuing to pass valid traffic and valid responses back. Now the cool thing about this is it's enabled for all routing algorithms on all ALB target groups, which means if you have an ALB today and you have a target group, you have two metrics, one that will tell you if it detected anomalous hosts. So you can go look at your zonal metrics for your target group, and if you see this anomalous host count metric above zero, you can go investigate and say, why did the ELB think this host was having a problem, and it might lead you to saying yes, we found the problem, we can replace that one host, or root cause the problem that happened. If you're seeing that, then you may want to turn the feature on so that you're routing based on the weight of the target, and this would have shifted the traffic away from those targets. We'll do this for up to 50% of the targets. And the key thing to know is that we include unhealthy targets in that count. So if you have half of your targets unhealthy, we won't be doing any anomaly detection. We won't be shifting traffic away from the other 50 because you've already scaled down how much capacity you actually have and we don't want to reduce that further. When you do have this enabled and we say we didn't send requests to a target, we'll emit a metric for the number of targets that we didn't send requests to and that's that mitigated host count. In testing and within internal users, it's been an awesome success for places where health checks aren't enough to detect and replace an impaired target. So here's a QR code to the what's new post that goes into this in further details. I will pause a second for that. Okay, so we also do this on network load balancer and it's slightly different. It's because we're using hyperplane, we have a little more visibility into the host as the traffic goes through them because the help checks for your NLB and gateway load balancer are actually going through the ENIs that the same traffic goes through. Our health check system 
tracks that traffic as it goes through all of the hops internally with all of those internal hyperplane systems. And if some of those aren't passing their help checks internally, this will actually shift traffic out of that zone using that same Route 53 help check, which will fail. This will remove the, the AZ from DNS and help your clients route to the healthy AZs. If all AZs in your NLB or any ELB are unhealthy, the DNS record will fail open. And that's really only useful in cases where you want it also to be considered as failed and you have another zone, another load balancer, or another resource configured in Route 53 to take that traffic. All right, so next let's talk about health checks and health. We're gonna go over health checks at a high level. We'll talk about the failing, oh sorry, this is the recap. Uh, so we talked about health checks. The takeaway is you're already using health checks. You may wanna change the configuration for them. You have fail open and fail over for your target group and Route 53. The default is 100% and we strongly recommend considering lowering that. One call out there is the target group fail open has to have a lower threshold than the DNS failover, meaning it has to trigger first before the DNS threshold can trigger. So you can't make the target group fail open after the DNS health check, it's a precursor. We talked about zonal shift, which lets you test or fail away from a zone through Route 53's APIs, and we talked about the cross zone feature for ALB, which is very useful for shifting traffic out of impaired zones. So now we're gonna talk about observability go through some mechanisms. We'll talk about our DevOps culture and view on that. We'll talk about visibility into your operations and systems, and we'll talk about doing deployments at AWS. So you may have heard we follow the DevOps model, and for us, the main thing that means is that developers who write the code support the code in production. So if you build a system like ELB, when it's something happens in production, you're the one who gets alerted. And that means you're on call, uh, because of that, we want to minimize bugging developers with needless pages. So anything we can automatically mitigate, say with a help check and then routing around it, we prefer that strongly. Uh, we only alert when we need a human to come and actually do something. And a key thing before we're going into production with a system is we write runbooks. And we review these runbooks in our weekly operational meetings if something happened that we didn't cover in those. And the runbooks need to be easy to grok or understand at 3 a.m. Because you imagine you're a developer, you're in the middle of the night, get alerted for the system. You've got to have something that you can actually understand and reason about. So with operational visibility, we break this into three areas. We've got canaries, which are going to send artificial traffic or artificially use the system and show us that some things are working. We've got metrics that are gonna show us how well our customer experience is, as well as how big our volume is and how much we're doing. And then we've got alerting, where we're gonna page or alert operators to come and help fix things. So our first canary we have is our data plane canaries. For ELB, we have data plane canaries in all regions, in all zones, and every data plane canary in the region sends traffic to every zone for every load balancer type for every type of traffic, IPv6, IPv4, TCP, UDP, HTTP, HTTPS, everything. And this system is non-mutating, so we don't change it. Everything that changes on it has to be transparent to the test, and the tests are just always running. If they detect an error or a problem, it pages us and we can jump on and see if there's something that we need to do to fail away from that zone or check to make sure our automatic mitigations are working. The other canary is our control plane canaries. These are full life cycle tests that we run in all regions, in all zones, for every type of load balancer that we have and every type of traffic. We launch a new load balancer, we configure it, we make sure it works for sending traffic, we change things, we make sure that works, and the change went through correctly. We delete them and make sure the delete and everything cleaned up. We run that every minute for every load balancer in every zone. Uh, if anything goes wrong, this is one of our first alerts to say, hey, Customers may not be able to, say, create load balancers. Now, when we look at metrics, we break them into two categories. We've got our positive metrics, and these show you how well your workload is working. Things like request count, volume of traffic, maybe success codes from your logs are all useful things to look at and say, we see the system is actually doing things. You may want to alarm on this if it goes to zero or goes out of an anomaly band using CloudWatch anomaly checks. Then we have negative metrics. 
Negative metrics are usually an indication that something's breaking or doing something unexpected. For EOB, this is frequently 5XX, TLS negotiation errors, backend connection errors, things like that. Other systems, you could have database errors, you could have something that's actually trying to do something, and then when it fails, your system emits this metric. When we're looking at our metrics, and this goes back to that 3 a.m., uh, one of the first things we look at is zonality. So we build everything so that the zones are as isolated as possible from each other, and we expect that one zone could have an impairment that wouldn't affect any other zones. So what I tell customers all the time is go look at your ELB metrics in the zonal dimension if you, st if you get alerted for a 5XX or another problem and see if that is only in one zone or if you're seeing it in all zones. If you're seeing it in all zones, because we have strong zonal isolation, it is less likely that that is the load balancer, which I know sounds counterintuitive, but generally this is what we find. So if you see it only in one zone, that's where you may wanna open a high severity case and say, hey, we're seeing these errors, it's impacting our service, please help. And support could go look at that, quickly see if it's one node, and replace the node gracefully. So when you're alerting on negative metrics, for example, ELB 5XX, there's a few things you wanna keep in mind. You wanna have key metrics and have alerts on pretty much every aspect of your key metrics. But you don't wanna just alert on one data point for one metric. So I generally say prefer short data points like one minute and many of them and leverage things like M of N. So you have something like 5 of 7, 8 of 10, something so you could detect a problem. It doesn't have to be sequential. Then we also recommend, and we do this internally, we keep two or more levels of alarming. So we have the level of alarming that says, okay, something might be wrong, but it's probably not worth waking anyone up. Maybe the automatic system will fix it. And then we have a higher level where it's, okay, this is getting a lot more severe. We need people to engage immediately, and that's the ones we set to page us. So in this example, we've got 10% is our lower threshold of 5XX, and we're doing seven out of 10 minutes. So it's gonna catch those longer, less frequent errors that maybe is something somebody could look into when it's daytime in their time zone. And then we've got a 25% where we've got a shorter window, but it's still more than one data point. And this is something that we wanna page people and say, hey, our alarm rate or our error rate has really spiked. We need to look at this right now because it could be impacting customers. Now, when we think about how to page or what to do when you're alerting operators, again, we prefer automatic mitigation, but the key thing is the alert has to be actionable. So if you have an alert on a metric and you get paged, a great place to say, was this actionable, is look at the runbook. And if you don't have a runbook, is it really actionable? And if it is, probably want to create a runbook, but you probably also don't want to page people if there's nothing they can do about it. We do pre-plan everything with runbooks, so when we're going a new system into production or a big change, we'll go through and have a operational readiness review, and part of that is to say, what are your alarms, what are your key metrics, and review and make sure those are set correctly, as well as what are your runbooks for when those break. The other thing we do is automatic escalation. So if an engineer gets paged and they're not making progress, they're trained to escalate, but we also have our systems configured to just automatically escalate if the ticket doesn't get resolved or put into a status that shows that it's actually progressing towards resolution. Another key component is our dashboards. So we do regular operational reviews, and we do these at the team level. Weekly, every team has an operational review where they go and look at their dashboards. Dashboards are grouped by topic, so we'll go look and say, this is this part of the system, here are all the relevant metrics, along with lines saying, this is where we've defined our problem level one, this is where we define our next level problem, and if we see something on those that we didn't get alerted for, we go dig in and say, why didn't we get alerted? Maybe we missed an alarm, maybe the threshold was wrong, and also check if there was customer impact. You can use CloudWatch dashboards, and this is a screenshot of a CloudWatch dashboard we created for an application load balancer. You can see it shows us some positive workload metrics where we've got our process bytes, our aggregate numbers of requests. We've also got the timelines for those. And then we have things like uh, response codes to show our 2XX, our 3XX, our 4XX, our 5XX. This is the kind of thing we would go look at and say, we see that we had a 5XX spike for 20 minutes and that we didn't get alarmed. So maybe we go look at that alarm, see why we didn't get alarmed. But CloudWatch dashboards are amazing. Recommend everybody use them. We really like them internally and use them all the time. So let's talk about deployment. 
when you have enough customers, I'm sure you all know, there's never a good time for downtime. You can't plan on your deployment causing downtime, and so we don't do that. When we make changes, we try to have graceful processes, and we bias heavily towards not having anything that would say this is an expected period of downtime. Because there's never really a good time for anybody to be down, especially on purpose. The other thing we do is we do blast radius, where we're gonna start with a very small cluster, a single box maybe, maybe a small cluster of boxes, and then we'll slowly expand, and we'll have a tight feedback loop of are our metrics looking good, and looking good for our health metrics, for our positive data, we wanna see that the volumes didn't change, nothing dropped off. For our negative metrics, we wanna see that we didn't have a big spike. If all that happens well, we expand our, our deployment, we don't deploy to the same region, in, the same, in multiple availability zones in the same day, and we try to use deployment stripes, meaning we're not gonna deploy to US East 1 and US East 2 in the same day. Now, as we get faster and faster with our deployment, we gain more and more confidence, and we do ramp that up, because we do have a lot of regions and a lot of, a lot of hosts to deploy to. Part of that, we have strict change management, so I'm sure a lot of you know change management systems. You've gotta plan for what you're going to change, and then, follow the, the runbook essentially you create for the change. Most of our changes we bias for automa automation and we deploy with things like code pipelines. This is all CI, CD, continuous integration and auto full automation so that humans don't have to watch it at every step or trigger the next level of deployment. The other thing that we changed a long time ago was we said instead of deploying off hours, we wanna deploy when the team that owns the service is awake, alert, and likely to be at their desk. So we can respond quickly and escalate to engage more engineers if the engineers who are on call don't know how to progress. That means we generally don't deploy outside of Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., local time for the team. So let's recap. We don't deploy with expected impact. When we do make a mistake deploying and we have a conversation with a customer who may have been impacted, one of the questions they will often ask is, you know, what did, let us know next time we deploy. And what we say is, we, we really don't do this. We need to make sure that our deployments don't cause impact. Whenever we have a deployment that causes impact, we'll do a correction of errors document. And it's a follow-up document to an event where you go look at what happened and why. The other thing we talked about was automatic mitigations. Things like health checks, auto-scaling groups are really great for saying your target went unhealthy. We replace it automatically. We didn't need to engage a human. We talked about engaging the human when it's valid to do so, when you should have, how you should plan for it with runbooks, and make sure that those are easy to understand and reason about. And then we review operations regularly. So every team has standing meetings once a week where they go over their own operational dashboards and these all go up the chain until we have the entire organization reviewing all of the key high-level metrics for the, every service. So that's it for my part for availability. I'm gonna hand off to Satya, who's going to talk about security. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so I'm Satya Ramasation, and I lead product for Elastic Load Balancing. Quick recap of the agenda. I'm gonna use a format very similar to the one John used. We're gonna talk about how we do things. So these are internal details on how we do some of our implementations on security. The intent here is to share our thought process when it comes to solving our collective challenges in security. Then I'm gonna talk about some of the features that we've launched. So these are things that you can configure in order to meet your security requirements. Uh, legend recap is the same as what John said. The two things I wanna call out are the internal details, the AWS user slide. Uh, AWS user icon, rather, so those will show up on the slides that have internal details and the rocket launch with features. So let's get started. What I first wanted to do was to talk about the key design components of an AWS load balancer. We have two. Um, we have the control plane. To use an analogy, it's like the captain of a boat. This is where our business logic lives that is onboarded through APIs, which the control plane converts to configurations that is pushed down to the workers. Workers, or the engine of the boat, is our data plane. And our data plane consists of several compute nodes that processes all the business logic for all of the traffic that we receive. So to put it all together in this analogy, 
the service is like the ship, so it's like elastic load balancing. The control plane is like the captain. The data plane is like the engine. Um, I wanted to set up these terms up front because I'll be using them throughout, my, throughout the rest of this talk, so I figure we all get on the same page. So when it comes to security, we recommend that you think about defense in depth with your load balancers. And what that really is is a layered approach to security where you have both network layer controls as well as application layer controls. And when it comes to load balancing, we recommend that you think about it in five areas. The first one being IP-based access controls. So think about this as coarse grain access controls or network level access controls. The second one is encryption and transit. So think about this as preventing man in the middle attacks. The third one is reliable authentication. So these are finer grained access controls. So application layer access controls, authentication, authorization, things of that nature. Configuration correctness. So the best way to think about this is after building and implementing a really secure architecture, a missed configuration could still cause exposure. So how do we get ahead of that? And then the last one is to extend your defense by using third-party solutions or solutions from other teams or custom solutions in order to achieve an even higher security posture. So I will be going into details on each one of these bullets, and I'll talk about some of the internal things that we do and then the features that you can configure. So let's get started. Uh, IP-based access controls. So our service, much like many services in the cloud, is built on distributed compute, where our compute comes from various physical servers that live on a number that, that are that are that live in a number of availability zones. So from a security perspective, what that meant for us is to have complete awareness of all of the IPs that our resources are consuming. And in order to accomplish that, we use security groups in our control plane and our data plane. We really like security groups because they are simple, easy, and intuitive to configure. And we really appreciate how useful it's been for us. We've also heard that security groups on NLB is a top customer ask. And we launched security groups on NLB earlier this year in August. Now, with security groups on NLB, you can filter your traffic such that your load balancer only sees traffic from trusted, known, and approved IPs. It works for v4 and v6 traffic. We've also enabled security group referencing such that you can lock your target groups to only receiving traffic from your load balancer. So this prevents extraneous access to your applications, which could potentially cause exposure. If you're a Kubernetes user, you could configure this using the AWS load balancer controller. Moving on to uh, defense in depth using encryption and transit, um, this has been a very key area of focus for us. And we focused heavily on this because a load balancer is the front door to most AWS applications. And we believe that having strong encryption at your front door carries over that benefit to everything that sits behind it. So our journey in the space actually started a few years ago when we experienced the TLS hard bleed issue together. And what we learned in, from that experience was there were flaws with several algorithms due to the software implementations of TLS. So we wanted a durable solution for this. And what we did was we built our own TLS library and open sourced it in 2015. The library is called S2N. S2N was built to be small, fast, and with simplicity as priority. And it does not implement some of the uh, rarely used cipher, uh, rarely used options and extensions um, from TLS, which was the main reason for the TLS hard bleed issue. We continuously validate this library to make sure that it maintains its high security posture. And also, having deep ownership of it allows us to quickly react to any issues that we see. With S2N in place, we launched TLS 1.3 on ALB earlier this year in March. Now both ALB and NLB supports TLS 1.3, and they both use S2N. 
At a high level, as far as benefits of TLS 1.3 over 1.2 go, there are two. The first one is it provides stronger encryption. And it, mainly, it does this by not including some of the less secure ciphers that TLS 1.2 did. And it also has a mandate for perfect forward secrecy where your session keys are safe, even if your long-term private keys were compromised for whatever reason. The second benefit is performance. TLS 1.3 accomplishes the TLS handshake in one round trip, which reduces latency and therefore you get better performance. When it comes to configuring TLS 1.3 on your load balancer, you have one, you have, you can choose from seven predefined security policies. Staying on TLS, another popular request for us was to enable FIPS on the load balancer. And to do this, we invested first to create our own um, cryptography module for FIPS. Uh, the module is actually called AWS Lib Crypto or AWS LC, and we launched it earlier this year in April. It is open source. It's owned and maintained by AWS Cryptography. We built AWS Lib Crypto. Uh, from a fork of boring SSL, but we added various performance enhancements to it. For example, we sped up some of the algorithms. And in our internal testing, we've actually noticed a 27% decrease in handshake latency for Amazon S3 when using this module. We recently received our FIPS 140-3 certification from NIST in October, and we plan on continuous validation so that you can easily deploy the new features and enhancements that the module provides. With AWS LC in place, we actually launched FIP support on both ALB and NLB last week. In order to launch this, we integrated S2N with AWS LC. So S2N handles the TLS handshake portion, that is the message exchange between the client and the load balancer, and AWS LC does the underlying cryptography. Just like TLS 1.3, you have the flexibility of using predefined security policies, and you have eight to choose from. And then the final point I want to make here is when it comes, uh, we also enable end-to-end -end TLS connectivity through FIPS. So if you want to have end-to-end -end connectivity, you could uh, configure TLS to the target, and we'll use the AWS LC module to establish that connection between the load balancer and your targets. Um, Moving on to the next topic, um, reliable authentication. So you guys, you all saw this diagram earlier where I talked about how we implement security groups in our architecture. But within our control plane and data plane, there are several agents that share a particular node. And in the spirit of giving access to only things that need it, there are places in our architecture where we establish mutual TLS between agents. We use mutual TLS to encrypt and authenticate traffic between two agents, and it's been extremely useful for us. We've also heard that mutual TLS on ALB is a top customer ask, and I'm thrilled to say that we launched it earlier this week in Dave Brown's innovation session. You can now safely authenticate offload authentication of X509 certificate-based identities onto the load balancer. With our mutual TLS support, we support both third-party CAs as well as AWS private CAs. So the third-party CA support makes it convenient for you to migrate your existing mutual TLS implementations to the, a to the ALB if you'd like to. We have support for revocation, so we have a durable way to block access to compromised certificates if you need to do that. We also provide certificate metadata in the request that is proxied to the target with which you can build your auth logic, auth Z authorization logic. Lastly, we've introduced a new connection log which can be used to troubleshoot or audit connections if you need to do it. This is the QR code for our what's new post for mutual TLS. Um, I'm going to pause for a few seconds in case you want to navigate to that place on your phones. I'm going to go over some additional details on Mutual TLS at this point. Um, I'm going to first start up with the setup. 
So in order to configure mutual TLS on your load balancer, the first thing that you need to do is to create a resource called a trust store. This is a new resource that we've introduced on the load balancer. It has two components. The first component is a CA cert bundle, which is essentially a root or intermediate and root or a set of intermediates. You upload this to the trust store in PEM format. The next thing you can do is configure a revocation list. This step is optional, but we use the well-known CRL or certification revocation list format in order to support the revocation feature. Next, you attach this trust store to an ALB listener, and then you just turn on mutual TLS on it in verify mode. Once the setup is complete, when we receive a client certificate, the ALB will walk the chain of trust and will make sure that we resolve to a route that was configured in the trust store. If a revocation check was enabled, we'll go ahead and perform that check. At that point, if everything passes, the user is authenticated, and now we establish the TLS encrypted connection between the user and the load balancer. Once that's done, we parse the certificate, and we add certificate metadata in the form of HTTP headers, which is then proxied to the target. Now, when you take a look at these headers, the first four are subject, issuer, serial number, and validity. Most customers will likely use these to build their auth logic, but if you have a need for custom fields, we've included the leaf certificate so you can parse it and build your auth logic based on it. Okay. Moving on to configuration correctness. Um, like I mentioned earlier, after building and implementing the most secure architecture, configuration miscues could re still result in exposure. And so the way we think about this is, how do we limit human access where we can in order to avoid misconfigs? So what we do is we typically avoid patterns that can lower our security posture, like static credentials, and instead use IAM roles, which have temporary or ephemeral credentials that are scoped to the deployment stage and for the dev test environment. By doing that, we keep our production credentials in the production environment, and we limit human access to secure resources. Having said that, we all operate complex services, and time to time, we do need human access, at least to configure your load balancer and other resources. So from that standpoint, we think about how do we prevent misconfigurations in a way that is not too burdensome on the engineers? And the answer for that is to have guardrails where certain conditions are met in order for a particular action to take place. So that sounds a lot like an IAM policy. And we use IAM policies extensively in order to prevent misconfigurations. Based on our own experience and feedback from customers, which is misconfig misconfigurations are a massive pain point, um, we decided to launch additional condition keys, five of them, targeted at improving your load balancer security. We believe that this is a durable solution for, uh, to solve this misconfiguration problem. So to take a step back, until now, all of the features that I discussed were to offer protection from the actual traffic that your load balancer receives. This is a control plane protection in order to prevent misconfigurations. Specifically, I'm gonna go over two of the IAM policies, condition keys that we've enabled because it ties to a couple feature launches I've already talked about. The first one is security groups. So now you can create an IAM policy with a short list of security groups that have been approved such that every new load balancer that gets provisioned or existing load balancer that gets mutated uses one of these security policies. So these policy, uh, uses these security groups, rather. These security groups can come from your central networking team or your audit and compliance team, but once this policy is in place, you can be sure that your load balancer will only see traffic from trusted, known, or approved IPs. 
In this policy, you can see that I've used star as the resource, but you could always make it so that you can use a particular load balancer or not So several teams that are operating the same account can use these policies in a way that it strictly meets their own security requirements. The next one in the space that I want to talk about is um, condition keys for TLS policies. It works just like the security groups one. Um, so with this, the high level is you can have a list of secure, TLS security policies configured in an IAM policy such that your new load balancers and the existing load balancers that are mutated have to use the policies that you have configured. In this example, I'm actually showing uh, ex some of the TLS 1.3 policies that we have. So if you use this, you're, you're guaranteed that all the new load balancers that are provisioned will always have a TLS 1.3 policy on it. And we can get creative with that, with, the, this, with this particular feature. For example, if you have a requirement for FIPS, you can just put our TLS policies that have the name FIPS in it, and now you're guaranteed that every load balancer that spins up is FIPS compliant. In addition, anything that you mutate will also have the FIPS policy on it. So to overall, we highly recommend that you couple these IAM policies with its corresponding security features to, imp to improve the overall security posture of your architecture. Next, I'm gonna go over an example architecture in order to tie everything together. So let's say you have a VPC, you have your clients on the internet, you put your internet gateway on your VPC, the next thing that you do is to provision a public subnet you always put your load balancer in the public subnet. I'm showing ALB, for example, here. Then you put your targets in your private subnet. Security groups on the ALB, so ALB only sees trusted or known IPs. Referencing on your targets, so you lock your targets to only receive traffic from the ALB. You enable TLS on the load balancer. You're using S2N for that. Mutual TLS, new feature. You authenticate your client with it. In the space of authentication, we have an integration with Amazon Cognito to do user auth based on OIDC, if that's interesting. Another security integration we have is with AWS WAF, in case you want to add additional layer seven protections. We talked about IAM for preventing misconfigs. And in this audit space, we also have integrations with AWS Config and AWS CloudTrail, so you can use Config for pulling changes to your configurations and, a and uh, CloudTrail for uh, looking, from an audit standpoint, to look at the activities in your account. So moving on to the final topic, extending defense in depth with third-party solutions. So in my previous slide, you all saw me introduce the integration of WAF with ALB. It's a very popular integration for us. And it's also a pattern that we really like, where you're able to insert a different service in order to extend or improve your security posture. The gateway load balancer was built exactly for this. And it is to extend your security posture using third-party appliances. So the background on this is as follows. A few years ago, we heard from several of our customers that they would like to use their existing security appliance to, because of their familiarity with it and to maintain their existing investments. And by security appliance, I mean things like firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, et cetera. So what we wanted to do was to provide a scalable way to integrate with third-party appliances such that they're easy to deploy, they can scale the way you'd like it to scale with an AWS, and have the availability posture similar to an AWS native service. With that in mind, we launched the Gateway Load Balancer in 2020 with a number of uh, partner integrations. Even within AWS, the AWS Network Firewall actually uses the Gateway Load Balancer underneath. So to compare and contrast, the ALB and NLB provide security for the applications behind it, and it provides security for the, traffic that it is that for the traffic that is addressed to it. On the other hand, the Gateway Load Balancer is a complementary service that provides security for traffic that goes all over the VPC, and it uses 
third-party security appliances in order to provide that security. More on gateway load balancer in terms of intro, in, in way of intro, sometimes I say GWLB. The GWLB is a protocol agnostic bump in the wire, layer three gateway and a layer four load balancer. It's a layer three gateway because you configure a next hop in a route table. It's a layer four load balancer because it does connection level load balancing in addition to target health checks. In order for its bump in the wire implementation, we use Geneve for encapsulation and decap. From a benefit standpoint, the gateway load balancer provides horizontal scaling and fault tolerance to keep your appliance highly available. It has, it has the ability to be across VPCs and accounts, which provides some very good architectural flexibility. And then the last thing is it allows our partners to provide their appliance as a service instead of as an AMI, because if you have to use an AMI, you have to maintain and up, upgrade it, scale it, et cetera. You can use the GWLB in two modes. The first mode is the one arm mode. With this, traffic from the source goes to the gateway load balancer endpoint onto the gateway load balancer. So this is a pattern that is the exact same as what we have with private link today, the endpoint to the load balancer, and then it gets load balance to the targets. After that, the reverse path is, the return path is the exact same thing in reverse order. So something like this. We call this the one arm mode because the traffic when it goes to the target goes to a single interface. Here you see ETH zero. This is the recommended config because the gateway load balancer sees traffic in both directions and can do stateful inspection. It is also the easier config. The next mode is the two arm mode. In this, traffic from the source goes to the endpoint all the way to the load balancer, gets load balance to the target, and it exits the appliance through a different interface to go to the destination, something like this. So it enters an ETH0, leaves with ETH1. This is a little bit more of a complex config, but it does give you some flexibility. And the main flexibility it gives you is you can change the five tuple. And so at the target, if you want a NAT or do something like that, you're able to. The only thing that you need to remember is when the traffic returns to the gateway load balancer, your appliance has to reset the five tuple back to the one that the gateway load balancer originally saw. From a use case standpoint, the dominant use case is internet, internet inspection. So in this diagram, you'll see traffic coming through the IGW onto an endpoint, and then from there, it gets forwarded to the gateway load balancer, onto the appliance for inspection, when the traffic returns, it goes back to the endpoint and then onto the destination. Another popular use case or topology is pairing the gateway load balancer with TGW. Here, we're able, I'm showing an example where you can accomplish both internet as well as inner VPC inspection. For the internet, in internet inspection, the traffic is coming through VPC number four, and then it goes to the gateway load balancer and appliance pair up top, so you can configure your appliance such that you are, you're, you're protecting yourself from well-known internet threats. And then the bottom one does east-west inspection. So you can have a different config here that is tailored to your east-west traffic inspection. So the fact that the gateway load balancer can be across VPCs and accounts gives the ability to have this central appliance VPC that can be used across multiple VPCs. That's a really nice benefit and a very common architectural pattern. From the time we launched, uh, we've really focused on these inner VPC and internet use cases, but as more and more customers onboarded to the gateway load balancer, we heard that they would like to inspect traffic from on-prem in a cloud-native way, and in order to accomplish that, because they had hybrid deployments, and in order to accomplish that, earlier this year, we launched a virtual gateway integration with the gateway load balancer. It supports two use cases. The first one is uh, traffic coming through a VPN. So your on-prem traffic uses internet connectivity that is encrypted over IPsec, comes to the VGW or the virtual gateway, gets forwarded to the gateway load balancer endpoint, onto the load balancer, finally to the appliance target. The other use case is the integration with Direct Connect. So in this, so if you want private connectivity, you can use Direct Connect between your on-prem and your AWS environment. 
And in this case, what happens is the traffic from on-prem goes through the Direct Connect gateway onto the gateway load, onto the VGW, and finally reaches the appliance target. Like I mentioned earlier, the Gateway Load Balancer is a partner-forward product. We have several partner integrations. I'm going to call it a few. From an advanced security perspe perspective, we have integrations with Palo Alto and Fortinet. From an analytics perspective, we're integrated with NetScout. From an orchestration perspective, we're integrated with Terraform. All of these are available through the AWS Marketplace. That brings us to the end of this presentation. Um, thank you all for being here, and we really appreciate your feedback, so please do fill out the survey for this particular session when you get a chance.